Hello again from Church of the Palms. We're so glad that you've joined us as we again this day reflect upon God's Word. We hope that you will find these to be helpful and that you may wish to share them with your friends and family and neighbors. Let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds by listening to some wonderful piano music. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to thee, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Hear the word of God. Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The, bow, the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. And those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked will perish in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversaries, will be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Tom Long, one of my preaching professors in seminary, told of the time when he sensed that God was calling him to enter into the parish ministry. And he sat down with his parents and told them the news, at which point his mother burst into tears. They were not tears of joy, they were tears of disappointment. She had grander dreams for her son, whether to be a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, whatever, anything other than being a pastor. So she shared this bad news, Long's mother shared this bad news of her son's going into the ministry with her good friend. And later her friend sent her a consoling note in which she quoted from Luke chapter 19, verse 34, the Lord has need of him. Well, this brought her some momentary comfort until she looked up the actual verse and found it inside the Palm Sunday story. And what the Lord had need of was a donkey, a jackass. It reminds me of one of the kids I had in my youth group a million years ago who was feeling the call to go into the ministry. And we talked about it a couple of times. And then I got a call from his mother who said, you know, we hear that you and our son have been talking about the ministry. I said, yes, it seems that he has some sense that maybe God might be calling him in that direction. Well, she said, there will be no more talk of that. Tim is going to be an engineer and we cannot have him entertaining any thoughts of being a pastor. Okay, then. As many of you know, I'm a fourth generation Presbyterian pastor, and when I share that bit of family lineage with people, I usually quickly add that it was the only work we could get. But the decision to give our lives over to the service of God seemed, I think for all of us, a rather natural and noble thing to do. Well, evidently not so in some other families. It would seem perhaps a sacrifice too great to pay. I suppose to one degree or the other, parents have the sense that they are somewhat letting go of their children as we see them make choices about their future, college, career, spouse, etc. But this call of God can be a tricky thing, except perhaps in the case of Hannah. In the first chapter of 1 Samuel, Hannah has spent the better part of, her, of the chapter lamenting over the fact that she is unable to have children. Her husband has a second wife who turns out to be very fruitful and bears many children, but not Hannah. But she prays to the Lord and invokes the aid of the priest Eli and makes with him a bargain that if she is given a son, she will surrender him to the service of the Lord. And sure enough, God blesses her with a son and she makes good on her promise. She surrenders him to the service of Eli. And what follows is Hannah's song, which I just read. It's a song which, like Mary in the Magnificat, she celebrates God who raises up the lowly while brings down the mighty. Hannah rejoices in how God has lifted her up, and her response is to offer her firstborn to the work of the Lord. I suppose it is an interesting way to think about parenthood, that there comes a day when we have to offer our children up to the Lord, and ask the Lord to use them as vessels for God's purposes, no matter what path they choose. Do you remember the famous letter penned by Abraham Lincoln to the Union mother of five sons, all of whom she had learned had died for the Union cause in the Civil War? The letter was to a Lydia Bixby, and it went like this. Dear Madam, I have been shown in the files of the War Department a statement to the Adjutant General of Massachusetts that you are the mother of five sons who have died gloriously on the field of battle. I feel how weak and fruitless must be any word of mine which, attempt, which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. But I cannot refrain from tendering you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of the Republic they died to save. I pray that our Heavenly Father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Yours very sincerely and respectfully, Abraham Lincoln. I suppose in a very real sense what every parent is called to do is to raise children who understand that the greatest calling in life is to give ourselves over to the lives of others, to sacrifice, if need be, our own lives for the sake of our neighbor. Several years ago, an incident occurred in the ancient city of Hebron in the West Bank, 
an area controlled largely by the Palestinian Authority. It involved five American tourists. The five were students and ultra-Orthodox Jews. And while they were on their way to visit a historic cave, believed to be by many the ancient burial site of Israel's great patriarchs, the five young Jewish students, however, on their way to the site got lost, took some wrong turns, and ended up in a Palestinian neighborhood. And before they knew it, they found themselves under attack by a mob of Palestinians. Rocks were thrown, Molotov cocktails lobbed, the car engulfed with flames. Eventually, the students were pulled from the car only for the mob then to begin to beat them. Faiz Abu Hamadiah, a 51-year-old Palestinian Muslim and businessman who lived in the neighborhood, witnessed what was happening and without giving much time to think about it, ran into the street and interceded for the Jewish students and along with his family, whisked them into his home to give them protection. Israeli security forces were called to rescue the young tourists. We gave them water to drink, said Faiz, and tried to tell them that they were safe, though they didn't speak Arabic. Had Faiz Abu Hamadiah given himself much time to think about it, he might have considered and weighed too heavily the potential consequences of his rescue attempt, not just in confronting the mob, but in what occurred a few days later. The Palestinian family received death threats from their neighbors and pledges to burn down their house. A reporter, when interviewing Mr. Hamadiah, offered that he was perhaps a hero, to which the Palestinian replied, I'm not a hero. I did it because I'm a human being. One hopes that somewhere there were two parents who were proud and grateful to see how their son, Faiz, had responded to the greatest of all the calls, the greater love, to lay down one's life for one's neighbor. On this Memorial Day weekend, we give thanks to all whose parents surrendered their children to the service of our country many of whom have been laid upon the altar of freedom, a holy sacrifice. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, for our children. We thank you for your call upon their lives. We thank you that when they understand and respond to that call to give their lives to you and to their neighbor, that they are participating in a great and holy work. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.